That was a video of Igorot elders chanting. Tonight, we're going to explore territory that is familiar because it involves poetry and music, but also unfamiliar because it involves traditions, rhythms, and ideas unfamiliar to the urbanized Filipino. Tonight is Epic Night, and I'm Manolo Quezon, The Explainer. This is the explainer where we explain why issues are issues. Now our explainee tonight is someone who sought us out instead of our seeking him out this time around, a member of the improv comedy group Spit, Kenneth Kang. Welcome to the show, Kenneth. Hi, glad to be here, Manolo. Well, Kenneth, okay, briefly, can you tell our audience what Spit does? Uh, Silly People's Improv Theater, um, among other things, does scenes either in short form or long form, completely unscripted, uh, without any notes, and we just perform them in front of an audience live. Okay, and maybe at the end of the show you can tell us where to catch your performances, but right now, let's ask our audience to join in the discussion. Sure. Uh, you can text react space x space your name and your question or reaction and send to 2366 for Globe and Sun and 231 for Smart. Or you can log on to www the-explainer.com. And we're also joined in the studio by students from St. Monique College of Manila. Welcome to the show. Uh, they're young uh, boys and girls and in the fourth year of high school, so planning where their life is going to go. But our discussion on epics and other things like that after this. Bruce Chatwin wrote a book titled Songlines, marvelously, a marvelously interesting exploration of the Australian landscape as understood by the Aborigines who followed mystical and mythical paths they called songlines. Now you and I make sense of the world in terms of lines too, although our lines involve western dates. But imagine if you were raised in a society that makes sense of the world according to different ways of calculating things like time keeping track of genealogy and what the Western mind perceives as myth and mythology are a fundamental part in this way of looking at things of how you perceive reality. Now go a little further and imagine if you had a centuries if you had centuries old ways of explaining your and your people's existence, what you call your cosmology, with that of an entirely different culture or people. The result can be one of, the, of several possibilities. You can abandon your worldview and adopt that of another group. You can reject that new worldview outright. Or you might end up combining the two. Now take a look at this clip. It was recorded in the San Jose Chapel, San Fernando, Pampanga on Holy Thursday, 2008. <laughs> Chances are what you just saw, the passion, is familiar to you. You may even take it for granted. But consider this book, Passion and Revolution by Ray Ileto, a groundbreaking exploration as, uh, of history 
from below, as he put it. In his landmark book, he asked some interesting questions. Did those who fought in the Philippine Revolution, who did, who did not come from the ranks of the Principalia or the Ilustrados, make sense of the revolution against Spain differently from their generals and the propagandists who had inspired those generals? He tried to answer this question by looking at what we all consider to be the dominant ideology of the Spanish regime, which was, of course, Catholicism. Now, he pointed out not even a, uh, that not even a Spain's conquest was both justified and facilitated by Catholicism. The way the religion of Spain was adopted, interpreted, and practiced by an our ancestors was heavily influenced by pre-Hispanic worldviews. He then explored how remarkable it is that even as our ancestors began their revolution against Spain, the motivations of our revolutionaries combined ancient legends like Bernardo Carpio and his mountains with that of the idea of racial redemption by the sacrifice of Rizal. But even this engrossing book only attempts to explain the political and mystical alchemy that created the Filipino from what had previously been different and sometimes competing societies. So when we return, we're going to be looking at an effort to track down our own song lines, the lines of poetry and song that represent cosmologies far older than what we saw in the Passion. That was a clip of a dasang by Datu Anglus Subongan of Kabar uh, Kabarakanan, Malay Balay City, Bukidnon. Now, I wanted to ask you something. Um, you know, you, you, you do performances and you're, you're in, in touch with the sort of culture that we all take for granted in, in our urban um, milieu, sort of, yes. so to say, speak. Um, but have you ever wondered how we seem to know more about things, let's say, like Beowulf, which is an epic poem of, of, from centuries ago from, from people very different from us, and we don't seem to know anything like uh, about what's going on in the clip we just saw. The sad truth seems to be, Manolo, that, yeah, it's a lot more likely that um, people, even say educated people, are more likely to know some uh, long ago Celtic uh, piece than uh, pieces from our own oral tradition. Um, I remember going through college, uh, apart from a lot of the stereotypical, uh, you know, novels by Rizal, uh, maybe a couple of novels by Nick Wakin, we've never really gotten to explore a lot of um, what can be considered our indigenous oral tradition. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good point, and, and I'd like to uh, return to that when, when our guest uh, joins us. But if the Pashon is an amalgamation of our indigenous folk beliefs and Catholicism, and if the Pashon in and of itself represents a basic cultural aspect of our various soci societies, and by this I mean the coming together of a community so that its core beliefs can be passed down from one generation to the next by means of folk traditions, then we can see that there's a very basic part of us that finds meaning by means of these oral traditions. In the previous segment, I asked you to consider how your culture might react to the introduction of a foreign one. One aspect is that the ancient beliefs will somehow find a way to survive even in the face of the hostility of the foreign culture. For example, as late as the 1950s, long after the Spanish era and that of the Americans and the Japanese, babaylans could still be found in the Visayas. Think of what it took for such a system of faith to survive for so long. And think of what it means that in the mere 50 years that's, that, uh, that's passed since then, what survived for centuries uh, has disappeared. For example, the Babylons and the Visayas have finally disappeared. And there is so much that has somehow found itself on the brink of extinction in the face of modern pop culture. The irony is that among those who can only be called our cultural heroes is herself a pop icon.